inspired by the brains behind the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Built by the brawn of Daryl Morey and yours truly, Jessica Gelman. And generously brought to you by our partners at Oracle. Live from our work from home studios to yours, we proudly bring you Trash Talking, a podcast designed to debunk and demystify the use of analytics in sports. We'll point out the dangers of using trash data in decision making. And in true baller style, we'll serve it up with good old fashioned trash talking and invite some of our best and brightest friends in sports, business, media, and tech to join the conversation. And now at five foot eight from Kager, also known as Kraft Analytics Group and MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference co-founder, Jessica Gelman. Also, weighing in at just over 200 pounds with a full beard from the Philadelphia 76ers and the other MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference co-founder, Daryl Morey. In our fourth episode, we are thrilled to welcome Nate Silver, founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning website 538.com and the go-to election predictor in the country. Nate first gained notoriety for developing Pakoda, a system for forecasting the performance and development of MLB players. Uh, He's a semi-pro poker player who does not play on my Thursday night poker night, even (laughs) though you should. I've not been invited. (laughs) I'm going to invite you. It's Maria and uh, Maria Ho and a bunch of former World Uh Series of Poker winners. So don't expect to win, Nate, but... Of course, known for his landmark book, Signal in the Noise, was named Best Nonfiction Book. Today, we're going to pick up where we left off at the 14th Annual Conference to discuss the future of sports analytics, as well as the use of analytics in election predictions and how the pandemic has impacted scouting and other things and some solutions Nate might suggest. I want to start with a little story. Nate, I'm sure you don't remember this. It was the 2008 or 2009 conference. We were backstage. You were getting ready to go up on stage and um, John Skipper, I was actually talking to him, but he saw you and there was like a little twinkle in his eye. And this was before you were named the hundred most influential person the, the next year. <laughs> he immediately stopped talking to me, which was appropriate. And, and then like six months later, 538 uh, became part of the ESPN family. So that is kind of the timing. It was 2008, 2009. So I think they were probably, so I got to see it all happening in, in the twinkle in his eye, sees Nate Silver. I mean, there is a lot of, there is a lot of industry stuff that happens at Sloan, right? That's, you know, that's where a lot of magic happens for sure. Magic. But, but the thing that about in 2000, and I think it was 17 or 16, you and I caught up in New York, we grabbed a drink and it was really, it was the first time that I had talked to you outside of the statistics and all the awesome work that, that you've done that Daryl uh, read uh, at the beginning of, of the discussion. But you and I sat down and it was just actually really awesome to hear you talking about running a business and the decisions that you were facing at that point in time, which was where what should 538 do next? Should you stay with the ESPN? Should you go to ABC News? Should you do something else? And I don't think a lot of people maybe know that that you're actually running a business in addition to doing all the election work, doing all the sports work, doing all of the society related work. And so I, I just that's why we had you on the entrepreneur panel last and year. Burritos. Just, and burritos, don't forget burritos. Burritos. I'd say well, I I would say like I'm doing less of the business running stuff than than in any recent years. Um because like, you know, ABC News, um, which now is the owner of 538, is a little bit more um, hands-on in some ways than earlier iterations of 538. So I'm, I'm kind of back to being mostly a content creator. Um, but there are exceptions, right? I'm still trying to negotiate 538's deals. <laughs> I'm still, you know, when there are big crises that hit, I can get called into things. Um, I still have lots of meetings with higher ups and so forth. And so, you know, it's, um, but it's probably 10% of my time um, when there have been times when it's 60 or 70% of my time. And it's, it's kind of tricky to wear all those different hats. Um, but yeah, at this point, I'm trying to, to revert, I guess, back to mostly just um, working on our models, writing a lot of articles, uh, mentoring people where I can going and doing a lot of media. And, and so it's a fun mix of stuff. 
Well, I mean, also at this point in time, you've built 538 into something really awesome that has tremendous reach and, and the work you did over the election was awesome. I wanted to speak a little bit about the election, but mostly as it relates to sports, as we talked about, obviously there was a lot of debate around it. So the main question, and Daryl and I are going to take this from different perspectives. Mine's obviously going to be around the fan customer, but there are some folks in the media space of sports who are trying to connect the issues with polling to the whole concept of market research. So there's a ton of research going on about will survey-based research, will customers, fans come back to games after the pandemic? And so I think maybe there's maybe some potential learnings of, and you've done a, obviously talked about this a lot, but as for you to think about some of the recommendations, changes that you've suggested on polling and how potentially we should be thinking about that for the sports fan and, and helping us understand what, how to better address them. Yeah. So um, let me give you a couple of different perspectives on polling, right? One of which is that polling has always been fairly challenging, right? People think, okay, well now polling is uniquely bad. It used to be great. Now it's terrible. And that's very exaggerated, right? If you kind of plot like a trend line of, um, of how accurate polls have been over time, it's not clear there's been much of a shift, but that implies a couple of things. One of which is that people assume that polls getting everything right is normal when it's not, right? Polling is usually off by several points, right? Um, but so why was why was polling not fantastic, to put it very kindly, in the 2020 election? Um, there are a couple of theories, but a couple of things I think are worth noting. Number one, Clearly, some people are more likely to respond to surveys than others, and that's always been known. Um, for example, older people tend to respond more than younger people, women more than men, white people more than people of color, right? For those kind of things, you can adjust. You can say, well, um, oops, we only got 6% of our panel is black, but we know that 12% of the electorate in the state is black, and so therefore we can just kind of count all the black people double. That's basically a primitive form of weighting. Right. Um, yep. The problem is, what if there are also biases based on unobserved characteristics? So one that's a bit of a problem is um, what's called like social trust. People that have higher levels of social trust, meaning they kind of participate more in civil society, they mm. may frankly have like more a better network and more friends. Right. They have families. They're part of the community. They're more likely to respond to surveys, and they tend to be more likely to vote not for Trump. Right. So that's one type of problem. Hmm. Another problem is maybe COVID specific, which is that um, Republicans and independents or for, actually not independents, Republicans literally were spending about twice as much time outside their households as Democrats. Once the pandemic hit, there are big partisan differences in who is doing social distancing and who is doing lockdowns. Um, if someone is bored at home, or not bored at home, maybe they're keeping taking care of their child, right? But they're at home, maybe they're bored, maybe they're not. They're a lot more reachable by phone than if you're out doing uh, outdoor dining or indoor dining or, or you know, whatever else you're doing if you're not locking down. And so yeah. their bias is introduced based on who is actually um, responding in a pandemic time. And the states with the worst polling errors were states that had the largest COVID outbreaks during, um, during October, November, when the final polls were conducted. And so, um, <sighs> So could that be a problem for other types of research? I mean, sure, right? There are gonna be people who are more likely to respond to polls. Um, I think for the COVID stuff, you may get people who are more stay at home actually than um, people who are going out, right? So therefore, if you take a poll and it says, oh, only 35% of fans are willing to attend an NBA game in the next year, or even with a vaccine or something like that, right? Um, that may be biased low because the people who yeah. are um, willing to go to an NBA game are out at a sports bar or something probably, right? Whereas totally. the people who are not are not. And so, and so with behavior on the pandemic, I mean, I think it's important mm -hmm. to pay attention to that and also look at, you know, what you'd call like revealed preference, like one paradox seemingly during the pandemic is if you ask people in surveys, do you want more restrictions or not? People say, yes, we want more restrictions. But if you look at how people behave, then, um, they don't behave like they necessarily want so many restrictions. And so and so that's pertinent to keep in mind any market research context. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you that, Nate, which is um, you're a data guy. You're trying to predict how people are going to vote. Yeah. There's probably quite a few things, pieces of data you would take over 
asking them what they're going to do, what would those be? Because uh, on the off chance you can even get them, it's not even the greatest data set. It's a good data set, but it's not the best. Like, what would be better? So if people are going to, so yeah, I think if you for predicting someone's likelihood of turning out, you'd also ask questions like, um, "Have you turned out in past elections?" Right? There's stuff like asking people about knowledge like do you know where your polling place is right that means they've invested some time in figuring that out right um i mean the problem is you can kind of error in either direction here you know um if you exclude people who haven't voted often before then you may miss a really big turnout year right when things change um you know but it used to be that democrats were less likely to turn out now it's a little bit different because trump relies on on lower propensity kind of rural white voters um and so it doesn't necessarily mean anymore that higher turnout helps Democrats. Higher turnout's kind of more of a neutral factor now. But but yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, there is like some sort of stats versus scouts <laughs> analogy here, right? Maybe a more blunt question would be, would, would NSA Nate Silver, who has everyone's search history uh, of everyone in the United States, beat Nate Silver, who has all this polling data? Who would win? Well, you'd have to have data that to calibrate the search results to how people actually voted, right? If you can't, yeah, do but that, you can predict whether they vote based on their search history, maybe. You can predict whether they vote. Yeah, that would help a little bit. Sure, right. You could look at like polling place, and I'm sure you could, I'm sure you could beat like self-reported um, intention to vote at least most of the time. So NSA Nate Silver would be current, like Nate Silver. Well, because I would, I would blend. I mean, you'd probably still give self-reported likelihood to turn out a fairly high weight, it'd be a blend, right? But you know, you could, I'm sure you can make meaningful gains around the margin. Well, the, one of the things that I said, by the way, with respect to the fans and the customer was specifically, if you are a customer of a team, you want them to know and have the right information to make decisions about how to improve the experience. And that may not be what actually happens you know, in a polling situation where kind of the end result, I mean, of course it's accountable, but it, they don't have like the result of if I tell the truth or not exactly, um, I'm not going to necessarily receive something as a result of it. Yeah, people aren't really incentivized per se to A, take polls and B, be honest in polls. Um, there's not a yeah. ton of evidence of people um, of people not being honest in polls. I mean, um, people are usually honest about who they're going to vote for. Sometimes if you ask questions yeah. about other things, they might um they might in this context kind of conceal politically incorrect positions but of all the various reasons why trump has performed well relative to his polls it's not that trump voters are not saying that they're voting for trump it's that trump voters are hard to reach on the phone in the first place yeah okay it's just biased to begin with that makes sense okay well we'll, we'll move on from the election related work and uh, get into the future of sports analytics where you really got your start we were talking with Bill James, and uh, we had a debate over the hardest major professional sport for analytics to help. And uh, I'm not going to say who is on what side. I'm going to say I'm going to ask you: Do you think hockey or the NFL is more difficult for analytics to help make decisions in? I think. Uh the NFL would be harder just because like, um, I mean, it's a very, very much a team sport and we don't have a lot of data on what, you know, half the positions in the league are doing basically. Um, culturally, I don't know. Culturally, um, I have some friends who work in hockey analytics and I think culturally hockey is even more of an old boys network than the NFL. And so culturally, I think hockey has been slower to adapt. I know football is quite traditional in some ways. Um, but in theory, when you get kind of player tracking data in hockey, I mean, in theory, you can do it could do a decent job with it, I think. I think it's just kind of at an earlier stage of development. I mean, ho hockey, keep in mind, like, it's not, you know, I mean, I love hockey, but like, far fewer people play hockey than play high school uh, football, for example. So it's kind of you're dealing with a narrower culture. Um, and that can make it kind of harder to, to let different voices in. 
But I think what I really like about Nate's take on this, not that it's necessarily different than yours, Daryl, because Daryl's point is that there just isn't enough pieces of information. Yeah, the NFL is this pointless 22 people. Yeah. And you only get 16 games. Like, it's crazy. But what if it, it so the thing that's tricky there, Daryl, is that you said NFL versus football. So I think that's important. But Nate's big, biggest point was that there will be less acceptance of it. Well, I'll, I'm also going to call on a, on a Bill James discussion that we had, which uh, we were talking about some of the challenges specifically around scouting this year for the athletes who effectively are maybe unable to be seen in person and be, see play in person. So from your kind of prior experience or knowledge how how do you think scouts and talent acquisition folks in Major League Baseball, how do you think they will need to address to address the draft differently this year as a result of the lack of information that they have? I mean, you might they might have to be more dependent on statistics. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't thought about if you kind of lose a whole year of data for every kid in the country, how that would affect things, right? I mean, one way it might affect things is that like um I don't know if you can trade draft picks in baseball. You might want to trade down, <laughs> right? Because like the premium, if there's more uncertainty, the premium on having a high pick wouldn't be as uh, profound if it's just kind of a crapshoot, you know? So you might want to just take a bunch of second and third round picks or something, because who knows? Um, you know, we don't know about the developmental impact as well. Um, one thing we found, I found in the NBA is that, um, it's kind of intuitive, right? International prospects who come from um, worse leagues, right? Who don't play in Spain, that play in the 15th best league in the world, right? Um, they have a steeper growth curve uh, once they start playing, right? Um, which isn't surprising. So that means they improve, but they're worse at first, but they improve more later on, right? Um, and so by that token, if everyone kind of loses a year of development, then those kids could be really bad <laughs> in their first year and then kind of make up for it in their second and third seasons and so forth. And so being kind of prepared for that, um, I don't know how it would affect projection systems and whatnot, but it could certainly be an issue. I will say, Nate, uh, if you could ask if you pull all 32 baseball GMs, I do believe the one thing they would like to be able to do is the thing you said, trade draft picks. They're so distraught that they cannot trade draft picks. Um, yeah, why can't you trade draft picks? It's so it's ridiculous. Picks, it's, it? it's completely ridiculous, and every baseball GM I talk to is, like, jealous. Like, oh, you can trade picks, and you can, like, even up the trades. We have to, like, find double-A and single-A ball players that somehow balance a deal, and it takes forever, and, you know, it's really tough. They have these, like, cash they can trade now that, that I think they can trade that's helpful. They can sort of virtually trade it. We did have a debate on uh, the Blake Snell situation. Actually, I was shocked that seemed to divide some data-oriented folks. I'm curious your take, Nate, see, see what you thought. I think that was probably dumb. I, I mean, you have to like... <laughs> oh, I love this now. Debate. I, I think you have to like... Because your model can always be wrong a little bit you know what i mean for sure um and so in edge cases and i think like a little bit of kind of common sense is probably worth something right or if you went back so and I, I agree with that but like you know like one of the biggest factors in their model right it's it's that if a batter sees the same picture multiple times they get worse and worse so i understand that it's not it's not that large i don't know how big it is so you're saying that's a marginal factor I mean, it's not that, yeah, it's not that large, right? I mean, baseball is a game where you're making very, very marginal decisions, right? And so it might make sense, but I don't know. I mean, there's also something about like um, in the postseason, a pitcher may be giving a fuller effort, right? Because he doesn't have to kind of preserve his arm at all. So you, I probably want to look at that, like at that sample, right? In a case where a guy is kind of leaving everything on the field, you have a couple more miles an hour on his fastball versus some training data that you're looking at but like so i have i have a high level take on this which is tampa bay 
might be the most remarkable professional sports team over the last 20 years. Like their ability to do like, like they're like actually the true money ball team as, as you know, not, not really all these others. And so I'm just guessing they factored these things in Nate and they, they, they did a very reasonable calculation and decided they should pull them. I mean, I guess you'd say if you knew you're going to get shit for a decision, if it's wrong, right. Then you must be pretty convinced of it to take it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because right. the penalty for that is is fairly right. profound. So maybe, but you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. or Daryl, this returns <laughs> us to the clutch discussion. This does not return <laughs> us to that. It kind of Try, does. Stop though, trying to force your clutch your clutch argument. No, it's I'm not trying to to force it. But I think what Nate was saying about in the postseason when there's more on the line and you don't hold anything back if someone is performing well in a game and they're and i understand the statistics and as you've said you cannot quote predict if someone is going to be clutch but if someone is actually exhibiting all of the behaviors that suggest that they might be having that zone experience that once in a lifetime experience or whatever it can't be once in a lifetime predictable but the the, 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 the I general love she's killing, she's i know killing her I'm really killing it. <laughs> okay so basically nate the whole discussion is is it possible to to define or see if someone is actually clutch and i know the argument about that it, i know the argument answer? that they're no I, i'm i'm leading him to i'm leading the witness <laughs> stop leading the um, witness let him answer Anyways, I think that this is a good example, though, potentially. So I'll give you a couple of context where I've looked at this, right? There is like, um, in the NBA, if you look at how does a guy perform in the playoffs for the regular season, and how repeatable is that? Um, there's a tiny bit of repeatability, but but not a lot, right? Like, I think we pretty much everyone's like, worse. Well, everyone's worse a little bit. relative to relative to the league, right? Um, right. Like LeBron on a going forward base, we predict is being like about one plus minus point better per hundred possessions in the playoffs in the regular season, right? Um, mm. Which is meaningful, but like it's also quite small. And he and like Kawhi Leonard are like the two kind of biggest outliers there in the entire league, right? And most guys kind of revert back to to zero or pretty close to it, right? So there is some. I mean, you know, a lot of it is like. There's a lot of questions in sports analytics, and I guess kind of in life in general, right? We're like, um, the quants kind of came along and said, no, basically clutch is bullshit, right? And if you want the more correct answer, it's that clutch is mostly bullshit, but there's probably a little bit there, right? And so now we're kind of refining and say, okay, you were 80% right the first time, but, you know, but there is a 20% here, although kind of what you mean by clutch is not so clear, right? Is it LeBron is performing better? in the playoffs or that LeBron is pacing himself very rationally in the regular season because the regular season doesn't really matter very much in the NBA, um, at least for certain types of teams, right? And so therefore you're conserving energy, you know? I mean, clearly like there's all types of stuff in the NBA where there are really big, um, you know, as y'all know, score effects in the NBA. So when a team is ahead by 15 points, it just is much, much, much worse in subsequent possessions. Um, there are big score effects in the NHL, right? But that makes sense, right? Those are both very physically demanding sports. Um, and why would you kind of not conserve some energy when um, when you're at no risk or low risk of kind of losing the game? So I don't know if that's clutch per se or or kind of pacing yourself. I, I just like that you quantified the clutch period it's different and that was i think my big takeaway as you said playoffs that's what you're defining the difference between playoffs versus the regular season which is probably a better parameter i agree and i'm sad that it's not more significant i i mean i think in i think in general people underestimate the importance of looking at the playoffs in all sports relative to the regular season right like in the nfl mm -hmm. for example um if you take teams with different ratings strength ratings or elo ratings or whatnot those differences magnify quite a bit during the playoffs right so a team with the i don't know a hundred point elo difference might be a five point favorite in the playoffs versus a four point favorite in the regular season which doesn't sound like a lot but if we're talking about marginal factors kind of actually adds up a little bit 
Nate, you're wearing a Detroit Tigers hat. So you're obviously a big baseball fan. But like what I've been hearing is you you actually talk about a lot of other sports too. So my my question is you maybe gravitated toward doing your first analytic work with baseball because there wasn't as much information available with other sports. Would do you think you would still like today make that same decision with the fact that there's so much more data available? Or is there one that you are like more interested in now because it's like raw or earlier on in the process? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, I'm probably most um, into the NBA now for a couple of reasons, right? Um, one being that like under normal non-pandemic scheduling, the NBA sets up in a really nice way with elections, right? Elections happen early November. The NBA season's getting started at about that time, right? And so you can enjoy the whole NBA season without the stress of like a peak election time, basically, except the first week or two. Whereas for baseball, every other year, I can't watch the World Series or whatever because like it's totally, you know, totally a crazy time for me. So that actually probably affected things. But like also like, um, yeah, the NBA is in this kind of fascinating era where we're getting a lot more data. Um, it's very much, I think, 90% of the way to baseball. Um, so yeah, and I kind of have to focus really on like, you know, one or one and a half sports because I have other stuff to cover too. And so, um, so it really has been basketball increasingly. Daryl, do you think that the NBA is 90% to, to where baseball is? Cause I mean, at least from no. our discussions, it seems like, yeah. 10, 10 years behind still. What does that mean? Like 50%? I mean, like, the NBA has been tracking 10 years behind baseball for a while. I, I couldn't give you a percentage. I just know that um, our order of magnet, like, they're they're on, like, really tiny edges. And we're on, um, and we're, we're still on, we're still on medium edges. So. If you're covering this kind of as a public figure and not working for a team, although probably also if you are working for a team, it's more fun when you're still in that medium steep part of the curve, right? Um, if you're way out <laughs> where you're mining for any 0.01% edge instead of a 1% edge, then it gets kind of, I would imagine, fairly tedious, right? And also like to get into it, like if I spent, I'm sure, half a year really familiarizing myself with um, every state of the art piece of baseball analysis, I'm sure I could add some insight, right? But like, but like it's a, you're, you're pretty far along on that learning curve. It's a bit like um, like poker now or something, right? Where it's like not solved, but like but you know you're getting to some pretty obscure territory in terms of studying things that might give you a very marginal advantage. Yeah, when they got down to worrying or whether or not a catcher had their mitt like like a three millimeters to the left yeah. or right as they were catching the ball, I knew that baseball was down to the really small things at that point. Nate, what are the things, I mean, in thinking that the NBA is in the medium, what are the major things that you wish you had data for, or you saw baseball ultimately got, again, conceptually data for that you would say, here are the things to potentially to look at? I mean, obviously defense is this giant (laughs) category still, right? Um, Where with the player tracking data, there's some stuff you can do, but like, you know, I don't think there's been good publicly available work done on, for example, defensive pressure, right? Um, there's talk of gravity, but how you implement that is maybe not necessarily so clear. So that's one big contribution, right, or uh, category. Um, but also, like, the relationship between um, between members of the team and the interactions, right, and kind of what part falls into the sum of the parts where you take five guys on the floor and you kind of add their – raptor wars together or whatever and have a projection versus like where is the kind of team uh cohesion where is the kind of intangible where's the value of coaching and a system right one thing we found is like we had um this new system called raptor that we launched last year and it very much worked as the sum of the parts model right each player has his rating you take the five guys figure out how many minutes you're going to play and that's your estimate of how strong the team is for that for that game right um alternatively you can just say okay let's look at how the team has played 
we don't care as much about who the players are. You have an ELO rating or whatever, right? Just look at how have the Lakers or the Rockets played over the past 10 games, going back to the past 100 games or whatever, right? Um, it turns out that, like, you actually want something like a two-to-one blend of the sum of the parts <laughs> rating versus the kind of team rating, right? I'm not describing this very well. Um, but clearly, like, when you have a certain group of players that are on the roster for, for half a year or a year and the team is playing well, then you should kind of, like, toss out your priors about, oh, these players aren't good individually, right? At some point, the team record speaks to the fact that that group of talent in that setting with that coaching and that scheme, right, that that's working. Um, it might not work if you scramble those five players around, those 15 players in the roster, whatever it is, um, and put them in other contexts. But, like, but there certainly is, like, team play in the NBA, especially on the defensive side of the ball, that I think is, is you know, I don't know if it's a lack of data or a lack of clever enough kind of analytical frameworks to to – to truly understand that. I'm sure the teams get that, by the way. This is kind of talking about the state of publicly available analytics. I think it's kind of like the, the white whale is really kind of team interactions. Following up on something you said earlier, Nate, um, about the importance of uh, how players may play in the playoffs uh, and incorporating <laughs> that into your analysis. Um, was that informed by your past efforts at forecasting and you adding in Vegas sort of uh, preseason rankings into your forecasts? Yeah, I mean, all these things are inspired by, I mean, the NBA is tricky, right? Um, you'll do something and it'll work for a while, then it'll break in some edge case, right? And then you'll fix it, but you'll wind up overcompensating in the direction, right? Um and you go back and forth. But yeah, certainly um, uh, playoffs are different in the NBA, right? Um, pace is slower. The game is officiated differently. Um, you know, clearly like everybody could knew, for example, that certain LeBron James teams, for example, were going to be much stronger in the playoffs than the regular season, right? And the question is kind of how predictable <laughs> might that be really, right? Um and there's kind of a medium degree of predictability. Some guys persistently have higher plus minus scores relative to strength of competition in the playoffs in the regular season. It's not enormous, but like if you have several years of having done this and dozens or hundreds of playoff games, it can become more meaningful. Um, we did not find any particular player characteristics that seem to predict this all that well. Um, I'm, I'm sure you probably have, apart from just the fact that some guys, for whatever reason, just have a consistent record of performing better in the playoffs. Um, and there's some persistence there. We just incorporate the flow chart, which is the one, if you're going to make the finals, it's just a one question, you know. Well, I mean, that's a problem, right? I mean, some, LeBron is such an important case, right? Where he could be like a one player, but how you handle LeBron, do you have a special rule for LeBron when he's in the finals? What is it, you know? 10 the last 11 seasons or whatever crazy number that is, right? Then like, then like at some point, <laughs> at some point you might just need like a LeBron variable, you know, and kind of when you're designing models, it's always this frustration of like, hey, I kind of know that this is going to be, or at least maybe I don't know, right? I suspect it's going to be wrong for this or that reason, but is it cheating just to have like a LeBron variable, you know? And then well, you that's where Vegas in. comes in. That's where Vegas yeah. comes in. And I like what you said on, you know, every case you try to correct for you end up often overcorrecting. like the nba draft is one of the best examples of this that i'm quite certain like the main rule of the nba draft if you're trying to look at it analytically is as soon as you find a pattern uh, it's almost like forecasting the market as soon as you find a pattern you're going to overcorrect for it and then the next great player is going to be hidden by that pattern and and it's uh it the nba draft i find to be maybe the most interesting puzzle that we we work on because these are like 18 19 year olds who don't even know who they are themselves so how are we supposed to forecast them um it's it's uh, it's it's a fun challenge the question i was going to actually have the the concept of lebron is like a generational player now it's interesting because meaning like that he's going to break the model or have his special his own special um component to it so like if you just looked at the NBA, you couldn't do that kind of an analysis, the concept of a generational player. But Nate, because you look 
across all the sports with 538 or your team can. It is kind of interesting to think if that how often there's someone like a LeBron who just, you know, breaks the model. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I mean, it depends on what sport you're looking at, right? Um, you know, in the NFL, um, it's hard to estimate player value, right? I think there's some notion that, like, an elite quarterback, a Peyton Manning or a Tom Brady, uh, Joe Montana, right? They might actually be about at the level of value that, that LeBron is, right? Um, you know, if, if uh, a great NBA player is worth 20 wins above replacement in an 80-game season, is Tom Brady worth four wins above replacement in a 16-game season, even when you're probably falsely giving him some credit that deserves the offensive line deserves the coaching scheme and the receivers deserve, right? I mean, that probably seems like it's it's not crazy or maybe even a little bit low, right? So a quarterback can reach that level of value. Um, in baseball, nobody can, right? You know, Barry Bonds had these years where he was putting up a war of 12 or whatever, 13 or 14 um, in a 162-game season. So, so much less value there. I mean, obviously a pitcher um, in an individual game is extremely valuable, right? Uh, but not only pitch one out every five games and hockey. I have done the least work on, but like from talking to friends and hockey analytics, um, you know, Sidney Crosby is kind of, that's more of the baseball type of mentality, right? Uh, the best hockey player in the world is not going to be as valuable just structurally. He's only on the ice a third of the time or thereabouts, right? There's a lot of randomness in hockey. Um, so basketball is unique. I think among the four major sports, plus the quarterback position in the NFL of, of having these truly kind of franchise players that like, again, can be like a playoff berth all on their own. Right. I don't think there's any other sport like that. Right. You know, if you take like a 25 win team and add James Harden, you're probably going to get the, the seven seed or something. Yeah. It's not close. Cause we only have 10 players on the floor and we play offense and defense. Uh, the elite players just have a, a very much outsized impact. And I think there's even an intrinsic sort of skew to the uh, to the probability distribution on great players in the NBA, but we'd have to examine that. But but I, what um, I was going to say is like also over time though, the NBA has like changed their rules to be more in favor of that one player, right? So like teams, there's less opportunity maybe to do team defense. You, I mean, those changes happen, obviously, in the NFL if you look at the protection that quarterbacks receive today, right? That's making them more valuable. So it's just interesting to see how the leagues are almost driving some of that in some ways. And, like, could ho – I mean, I don't – maybe hockey you can't change, but are there other sports? And I don't think you can in baseball, but I think just an interesting thing to maybe – Well, in baseball, I think in theory, if you had a Mike Trout-level hitter – combined, you know, with a, you know, top five pitcher, you could in theory get close to something resembling uh, the impact a, a top NBA player makes. That has never happened. But. I mean, you have Otani, right? Um, but no, in yeah. theory that could, Babe Ruth is a hitter plus pitcher if he had kind of really done both at once and played 155 games or whatever, right? Then that would be, that would be close. Come close, yeah. Well, so you brought up the, the Raptor model that you guys created. And my question is, you guys have obviously a ton of awesome models on 538. Which one gets the most engagement? And obviously it can be cyclical. I'm talking about sports models. I mean, the, um, I think our NFL model gets the most page views, even though it's the least proprietary, right? The models we put the most work in on are Raptor, which is our NBA model, and our, our soccer model. Um, and they do get a lot of traffic, but like this relatively simple NFL model used to just be an ELO rating. Now it has quarterback adjustments and you know travel distance and stuff like that, but it's relatively simple. People do love the, the NFL still. They love to bet on the NFL. Um, and, and yeah, I found myself... Um, getting less in the habit of watching the NFL. Again, it's part of the election thing where like, you know, your Sundays, you're not necessarily able to be free and watch football. Um, but those are kind of the, the three that get the most traffic. I mean, there's a ton of interest in 
in soccer. We had like literally like, you know, 60 different men's leagues and two or three different women's leagues around the world that we now have updated ratings for. And so, I mean, soccer is obviously, I think um, it's been considered the sport of the future for decades now, but I think even in the U S now, right. If you look at kind of when you ask people under the age of 30, what's your favorite sport? Soccer is starting to overtake baseball, for example, and be very competitive with other sports too. Uh, I wanted to mention, by the way, just a thank you for the amazing women's sports coverage that you have on 538. There's, I mean, it's great and, and it's analytical. And the other thing is that it's woven in to all of the sports that you do. You don't like separate out the women's, uh, the women's coverage. And I think that it's, it's very valuable what you do, especially for someone like me who likes to read about women's sports with the analytics slant too. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. We're also working on, uh, oh, sorry. We're working on WNBA stuff too. So we're, but yeah, that, there we go. um, it actually gets a fair amount of traffic, our women's sports coverage. There's an audience for it and people who don't try it won't discover that audience. So I'd recommend it to other publishers too, like not just for equality long-term, but like there are a lot of people that care about women's sports. Well, it's actually interesting, uh, Nate, you, um, you may not know this, but Sue Bird was our guest on the previous podcast and uh, Daryl threw out some challenges uh, about her stats. And I mean, two pieces of information. First, big thank you to Kevin Pelton who actually went and did the analysis of performance, Mm -hmm. what we might call clutch performance in the last five minutes of games that are within five points as well as an OT. And uh, it turns out that in fact, um, Sue Bird is clutch. She shoots 49% in those moments. Interestingly, Tamika Catchings shoots 58% in those moments. Now, she had a smaller sample size, but I think just pretty cool. Thanks to Kevin for doing that analysis. But one of the things that did come up, we talked a lot about with Sue, and Daryl also is aware of this, but someone else had done an analysis, or one of the questions we talked about was the hockey assist, the assist to the assist. And someone um, did the analysis and posted it up on social of people who led in hockey in the hockey assist in the NBA. I asked them if they could do that for the WNBA, and the data doesn't exist on the WNBA side to be able to do that assist to the assist. Oh, it's there. It's it's it's. You could literally just take the data and crank it out in ten minutes. You do have a good uh, thing going on the women's side there, but there's there are a couple of women's areas that are coming up in that space um as well like there's this one just women's sports and the gist but how are the 76ers looking in your model Nate? i need to know i need to prep i need to prep my owner i think it likes the 76ers pretty well i mean it like i mean the thing is like um it liked philly and boston relatively well and how well that looked in the end i don't know right but like um yeah, I, I've heard what's coming out. The team that really surprised me is like uh, the Suns got like a surprisingly good projection because they're young. Wow. Number one, they should finally be relatively healthy. And like Raptor just loves Chris Paul. Um, so they could be kind of frisky, I think. But no, it, it um, I think it had kind of, you know, Philly, Boston, Milwaukee is kind of actually um, – the top tier in the East and then uh, Miami kind of a close fourth. Is there a generational factor for a GM like Daryl, like a LeBron factor, but a generational? (laughs) (laughs) No, no, there is (laughs) not. We've been looking, so we've been looking at like whether, uh, you know, looking at like continuity scores, how much a roster is consistent from year to year, we've been looking at whether, you know, coaching or management, if that would factor in potentially in theory, it would, but we haven't, we haven't finished that analysis yet. It's very correlated that a lot of continuity is good, not super causal. I'll, I'll give so you So we don't answer. assume, yeah, we don't assume that continuity is good per se, but the question that I got into earlier about how much do you use the, team performance rating versus sum of parts rating, the more mm-hmm. continuity there is, um, the more you should look at team performance, the less there is, right, then, right? The, um, that makes sense. The 90, 
the 1999 Chicago Bulls post Jordan, right, should not get any carryover from their previous <laughs> ELO rating, right? So Nate, we have a game. It's called bench trade or franchise tag, and it's our take on kiss, date, or marry. So we're going to give you three things, and you're going to tell us whether you would bench it, trade it, or franchise tag it, and why. And the why is important. That's the big differentiator. Nate, bench, trade, or franchise tag, runs created, uh, secondary average, and uh, defense independent pitching. I'm going to franchise tag runs created. I mean, for as many years as it came ago, it was like a forerunner to things that are more quote unquote advanced, but probably does 98% as well in most cases. Um, underrated kind of classic player, if you will. Um, dips, I'll trade, there's some trade value there, right? Obviously it um, was pretty revolutionary in helping us to understand the contributions of defense versus pitching, but A, it's like, doesn't completely describe pitching, right? And B, there are probably a lot of exceptions. I haven't studied those in that many years, right? But it's not, it's not truly, it's completely independent. And then I guess I would bench secondary average. Um, okay. Sports. This is taking us back to sports in 2040. Set of current rules. Which of the by sport would you bench tra- or franchise tag? Baseball, soccer, football. We all know what Daryl feels because he was very adamant about it on our panel at Slowed last year. So I would franchise tag soccer. Um, the fact that like, so soccer actually has like far fewer rules than other sports. If you like literally look at the size of the rule book, it's, it's, um, it's fewer rules. And I think that makes it more robust. It's one reason why it's enjoyed um, in so many countries, right? Um, you know, I'm sure there are soccer aficionados have complaints about things they'd like to see change. I'm sure you can talk about like uh, the offsides rule. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of debate about um, about uh, instant replay and where that d- detracts from the quality of the game. The penalty rule, I think, is a little bit too binary, where um, you're basically are giving a team 80% of a goal or whatnot, which seems kind of extreme. Um, but soccer has withstood the test of time. Um, it allows for a lot of robustness in how the game is played within that set of rules. So that seems like it needs the least work. Um, I mean, bench versus trade. I mean, I guess I trade football. Um, the NFL is kind of the opposite extreme of soccer in the sense that like, it's always kind of a patchwork of very obscure rules that are kind of hyper engineered to like produce a, a entertaining product. Right. And they're making fairly radical changes to it. And so if you're kind of consistent with that, then um, then that works, I suppose. But like that means baseball is getting benched here, as I remember from our pre-pandemic panel. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, unlike in the NBA, where I think the analytics revolution in the NBA has led to a very fluid, lots of spacing, right, high pace, I think the NBA is really fun and dynamic to watch right now. I think you can get to some extremes sometimes, right? Um, but in baseball, the fact that so little of the action actually involves balls and play, right? Um, and the pace of play has slowed down. Um, and it seems like you no longer have this diversity of different, you know, skill sets that you used to have in the 80s or whatnot. I mean, I think baseball um, is in some degree of trouble. And I think the fact that, like, the tweaks they're making have been kind of all over the place. I mean, I don't know, right? I, I like, for example, I like having no designated hitter because that creates more strategy and more differentiation, you know? Um, but it feels like baseball is like kind of tinkering around the edges with this, like, you know, 20 men or man on second base and extra innings. I'm not sure I necessarily like that. No one is, I don't dislike when I'm at a baseball game and there's extra baseball to be played. Right. Um, I don't know. It just seems like, uh, they're addressing the problems that like don't need to be addressed and not addressing as directly the kind of problems that do need to be addressed. Right. Which is if it's all home runs and strikeouts and walks, then that becomes much more tedious and it's a huge difference, right? It's not like some minor difference. Like it's a 
totally different game than it was 30 years ago or something. Can I make a point on soccer that they've they've made their rules worse too? So indirectly, so on the penalties, which is just crazy, like how big of a penalty it is as you, as you talked about. They made it worse this year. Um, used to be on a penalty shot, the only chance for a goalie would be to die, guess and dive and then make a good play, right? This year they decided they're going to enforce one of the few rules in their skinny rule book that you just pointed out that probably needs more rules, uh, that the goalie, the go- always on the books was the goalie can't move before the ball is struck, but in practice, you know, if you moved a microsecond before the ball is struck, they would let it go. Now with VAR, they're literally like, the goalie has to be a statue prior to the ball being struck at 110 miles an hour into the corner. Good luck, human, trying to stop this thing. So they've they've literally made it worse this year. So I just wanted to continue my rant on soccer. So. Yeah, I mean, not every use of replay is, I don't know, is a positive necessarily. But, um, yeah. Wait, you say that because you think that there should be – why do you think there should be less instant replay? That I, I'm not necessarily – Well, it's not, about, it's not about replay per se, but it's about like – there's a certain equilibrium in the sport, right? And the equilibrium probably designs to provide some notion of you know competitiveness plus entertainment plus fairness or whatever, right? Um, and if you more kind of rigorously enforce – rules then you may upset that equilibrium in in some respect right like another one is in the um in the nba with um who deflects the ball out of bounds right it's kind of ambiguous it's almost like some weird physics problems sometimes trying to figure out who is responsible for deflecting the ball out of bounds who last kind of touches the ball right but clearly there is a notion that like if the defensive player aggressively kind of slaps toward the ball, right, and kind of knocks it out of the player's hand and it kind of glances off their fingernail. Clearly the old way that we referee with a replay is that, yeah, it's, you know, offense gets the ball back, right? Um, And now you might not get the ball back, which is kind of like not really the outcome that like if we all got together and said, let's design the best of the NBA rules, right, we would say, okay, if one player is responsible for like the substantial amount of force to deflect a ball out of play, and there isn't, you know, quote unquote, substantial contact that causes the ball to deflect in another direction. So I can like knock the ball off you, then it's your fault, right? But like if I, the fingernail wouldn't count. Anyway, but the point is like we had a better standard <laughs> kind of pre-replay for what people really wanted and what they thought was fair. And now that you're enforcing it by the letter of the law, then it's actually like worse in some cases. It would be a problem, for example, like you get fouled all the time when you're when you're shooting shots and it's not called. That's part of the game, right? that it I think your point about it being equally unfair is like a really good one. And that's part of I think should be part of the game in, in many ways. Yeah, all the sports using replay, us soccer, um, the NFL are going through a real tough period where you have like in theory, if you sat down you'd say, let's enforce our rules and then when you go to video, let's do that. But it turns out in practice there are a lot of like gray areas that referees were basically trying to achieve fairness, not, not follow the letter of the law. And in many cases, that's what fans want. Fans want fairness. They don't necessarily want whether or not it went off to Nate's great point of fingernail or whether or not Peter check, you know, moved a two milliseconds before the ball was struck. They just want, they just want a fairly, a fair playing field and, Referees used to optimize for that, and now they're being asked to optimize to the rules. It's not always congruent to the larger objective. Yeah, sometimes there's like this notion that like the rules were handed to you from a tablet on high, right? Um, no, I mean people we we make the rules ourselves, right? And so, and we make them under certain assumptions about kind of what types of information we'll have and kind of how things are enforced, and and if those assumptions are different, then you have to like then you have to reassess um, and not get overly wedded toward things that were meant to produce a different equilibrium than you might have under current conditions with replay. And the, M- the NBA is finding that they have to rewrite the rule book. So they're on a big task to rewrite everything, rewrite traveling, because it was just poorly written or not written at all. 
Yeah, the notion that you have rules that are kind of selectively enforced. I mean, there used to be kind of this cliche that, hey, every every NBA play actually is a foul, right? I don't know if it's true or not. Um, it's true. But, yeah, <laughs> but that, that would seem like it creates a problem. When we when we talked to Jonathan, he actually like specifically said like we, I want to take the bias off of the refs, you know, hands. And it's kind of interesting that we're coming to a point where we're saying, well, some of that is, you know, it, it's again having this equal equilibrium of fairness is 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 a really good point. Nate, thank you so much for joining us. We hope we can count you in for our 15th annual big one conference on April 8th and 9th. I think you've been to 12. I've been to, yeah, 11 or 12, probably, I think. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, of course, as always. We love your support and thank you for coming on the podcast and congratulations on such a crazy year. And now you can enjoy some NBA basketball. I will, I will, I will, because there's not that much to do. <laughs> in a pandemic when it's cold out, the election's over. I'm going to watch a lot of NBA. Post-game huddle. Great discussion with Nate. Uh, I really enjoyed so many different parts of it. Here are my, my main takeaways. First, on the polling and why it's relevant or can be relevant to, to sports, this potential um, missing... Uh, the, the people that are getting polled for sports are likely to be the folks who wouldn't be out and about and going to games anyways. I thought that was a really interesting point with some of the biases that happen. Second, I hadn't, the clutch concept, most specifically about defining what clutch is and what is the parameters of it. So is it the playoffs, which is what he said, or is it say the last five minutes of a game when the, when it's within five points? Um, I, I love the insights about the NFL getting the most uh, engagement on, on 538 and the why, which is the interest in, in football and potentially that there's more opportunity there. Of course, I also love that, that women's sports has a market and that 538 is capitalizing on it. And my last main thing is, is the, this, this discussion around the refs and the instant replay and this concept of equilibrium and competitive plus fairness plus rules. I think it's just a really interesting concept for us all to think about uh, with, resport, with respect to the sports and, and how it's played today. What'd you get? This probably breaks our rules, but I, I enjoyed most how wrong he was about soccer having good rules. So. <laughs> no, I don't think it breaks our rules. I'm allowed to enjoy something he's so wrong about. That's good. Sweet. I think you feel very strongly about soccer. I I appreciated how his perspective as to why soccer, but I I mean the point about penalty kicks is just is for that he he it was interesting because he you know I think he actually was a debater, but he he like laid out the issues with soccer and why he still thinks soccer, which is predominantly around the history of it and, and its success around the world. I think from a viewership, he does have scoreboard. I, I agree with scoreboard in that uh, lots of people love soccer, but that's mostly because, you know, it's like when you're young, you're just handed these beliefs from your parents and people just usually just take them and consume them. And uh, that's, I think that's true of soccer too. Like people just assume those were the right rules and the right number of people and don't really think about how to do it better. I think it's, I, I agree that they don't think about how to do it better per se, but I think it's that it's relatively easy sport to understand and it doesn't cost a lot to play, right? You just need a ball and something to try and kick it into. If they, if they, but if they had endowed, endowed the sport with 12 players, everyone would be like 12. That's, we got to have 12 players. It's, it's, it's too sure many. All right. Well, cool. Um, Nate was amazing. Nate is so talented in so many different ways. I actually just really enjoyed hearing the two of you go back and forth. And I thought you guys were going to start like throwing out some like different types of models. And I was like, man, what are we going to get into here? So you didn't do it. Well, it's always fun to get with you and Nate. Uh, I think we could go forever. So. Yeah, it's true. Thank you, Nate Silver, for joining this episode. 
Thank you, Oracle. In sports, as well as business, analytics drive the actions you need to succeed. Oracle Analytics provides one of the most comprehensive AI-powered analytic capabilities for both business and IT. When you're ready for peak performance, it's Oracle Analytics for the win. Thank you to our listeners. Hope you had fun. Thank you to Lance, Jason, Maggie, and Andrew had to endure the torture of this podcast from start to finish. Thank you to the MIT Sloan students, especially Andrew Lynn and Maggie Riddle. Is it data or data or data or data?